this series on um, the state and the church and in the current section that we're discussing we're discussing the role that the church plays in interacting with the state how God expects the church to behave in the world in which we find ourselves and um, in today's discussion specifically we want to discuss the conduct that the church that God expects the church to display in the earth and the reasons for it and uh, a passage of scripture that will open up today's discussion with is in Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 to 15 the apostle Paul writing he says therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling For it is God who works in you both to will and to do uh, for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Why? That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And so we see that uh, God requires the church to shine as lights in this world. And we see heaven's view of what this world is like. Uh, It refers to them as a crooked and perverse generation. And so the Bible clearly describes the church, the uh, the saints as being light and those who are in the world as being darkness. And so just as light and darkness are complete contrasts to each other, so it is that the church is meant to portray a complete contrast to the world's way of living. And that contrast is the righteousness of God. We are meant, um, as far as heaven is concerned, we're meant to display God's righteousness in the earth so that the church by and large really becomes the benchmark uh, for the world to look at um, and to see how it is that they, they in fact should behave. And so we see because of that requirement that we are called by God to display his righteousness in the earth it becomes very important for the church to deal with sin within the church and uh, the apostle Paul again when in, in one of his writings Ephesians 5 3 and 4 he talks very clearly about the fact that the, the church is not even to have sin named within her we are meant to be displaying the righteousness of God why Um, so that the world can have um, uh, the the ability to view what God's kingdom is really all about. And so it's very important for the church to walk in uh, a um, a conduct that displays the righteousness of God and that shuns the sin of the world. The Apostle Paul emphasizes that point to us in another one of his writings, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside, also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. And so one of the problems that the church does encounter is that quite often the church tends to uh, uh, judge those who are outside of the church. Uh, in other words, when, when, when the church uh, sees sin in the world, it tends to condemn those in the world for their sinful practices. But that's not our, our uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, that's not our prerogative. Paul says, those who are outside, God judges. It's not up to the church to um, condemn the world for their sinful lifestyles because they are doing 
what they what a sinner does. They 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 are sinning. However, Paul does say that the church is meant to uh, deal with sin inside the church itself, and he said we're not to tolerate it. He talks about shunning those who uh, who are, are brothers or sisters in Christ who habitually practice sin. So we're not talking about a one-off uh, uh, commit, committing of sin and then the, the person repents. There, there's no issue there. We're talking about uh, Christians who continually practice a lifestyle of sin, be it be a drunkenness, uh, be it being a reviler, uh, covetous, sexually immoral, etc. Paul advises the church to then isolate those individuals and withdraw fellowship from those individuals. Now, why do we do that? He says that um, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, 15, he says that we don't condemn them, but rather we admonish them as brothers so that they will come to repentance. The idea is to um, clean up the church's act from, the, from their point of view. The church should not tolerate sin within the church and as I say the church needs to differentiate here uh, the church doesn't um, encourage sinful practices in the world not at all but the church doesn't condemn sinful practices in the world what the church does is the church displays the righteousness of God so that those in the world have something to look at and say well, there's something different about those individuals and they see the righteousness of God displayed. Now, if the church itself is walking in a lifestyle of sin, practicing the same things that the world practices, well, then, you know, the world looks at the church, sees no difference, sees no benchmark to compare itself against. against and so the, ch the world is then encouraged to con continue in their immoral lifestyles because there is no uh, benchmark for the, the, the world to look at. And Paul also talks about that particular issue in Romans chapter 2 verse 23-24. He says, You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. And so Paul is really addressing Jews in this passage of scripture he's saying you guys are, are bragging about the fact that you have the law of Moses but your lifestyle blasphemes God because you are breaking the law of Moses in front of the world in which you proclaim that you have uh, the laws of God and so that same principle applies to the church for the church to condemn the world for uh, their sinful practices while at the same time walking in those, those self-same sins, well, the church is then obviously hypocritical and thus blasphemes the name of God before the world. And so very clearly, God expects the church to walk in a righteous lifestyle. Now, why does he do that? He does that because he wants to be able to... Um, convict the world of their sinful practices and he, uh, it's because the world observes the righteous practices of the church that conviction then takes place but if the church is walking in the self-same sin that the world is walking in well obviously um, there can be no conviction taking place and so God uh, his hands are tied pretty much in that in that area and society then begins to uh, go into a moral de decline because there's no um, well, benchmark we've used, but there's there's no hindrances. There's there's no um, stopping that because the church is not displaying the righteousness of God in the earth. Very important that the church does that. Uh, Peter talks about it in his writings. He says. Beloved, I, in uh, Peter, 1 Peter 2, verse 11 to 15. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as those who are sent by him 
for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And so uh, Peter very clearly talks about the fact that God uses the righteous behavior of the church to convict the unrighteous behavior of the world. So, so important for the world to be able to look upon the church and recognize that their lifestyles are different to, to, to mine, to our, our lifestyles. There's, a, there, there's obviously something there that is different to what I have. And so God is able to use that in order to convict the world of their sinful practices and their need for repentance. Um, he talks about the fact that they um, observing the, the, the righteous lifestyle of the, um, of the believers impacts their lifestyles. It does, have, it does have an impact. So it's so important for the church to not only live the righteous lifestyle that God has called them to, but to clean up its own act. In other words, make sure that within the church, sin is not tolerated. Um, because if the church does tolerate sin, it has a huge impact on the society within the, which it, the church finds itself within. Because there's no longer any kind of uh, benchmark that the Holy Spirit can use to then convict those who are in the world of their sinful practices. Because they look at the church and they say, well, if this is how God's people behave, there's no difference between my behavior and theirs. And so nothing changes. If anything, it only gets worse. Now, you, you, uh, the way that God does this is that he uses the conscience of the, those in the world to change their behavior. Um, you recall our Lord Jesus when he was on the earth. There was that woman uh, who was brought before him who had been caught in adultery. And the Lord didn't say anything about the issue. He had just allowed the conscience of those accusers to come to the fore. And when that happened, they recognized, their consciences convicted them of their sinful practice, of trying to, uh, of, of the hypocrisy of trying to convict uh, a woman of adultery, whom, and they had obviously partaken of those self-same sins. And so their consciences convicted them, and they were forced to change their behavior. In other words, they no longer tried to uh, um, condemn her. They basically gave up on their practices. And so that's the principle that God uses. When the, the, the world of, are confronted with righteousness, their consciences convict them of their sinful practices and thus elicit a change in behavior. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody who sees who's in the world, who's, who's practicing uh, sinful practices, who sees the righteousness of the church, will then come into the kingdom of God and, and, and thus be saved. What it does mean is that their sinful practices will begin to change. And so the, the church will then see a change in society around it. And so it's very important for one, the church to uh, display the righteousness of God, the church not to tolerate unrighteousness within the church and not get confused on this issue because as I say, a lot in the church like to go after those in the world and condemn the, the world of their sinful practices. Well, that's just uh, hypocrisy or that's, you know, that's just, that's not God's requirement of the church at all. God judges those who are outside. He expects the church to judge those or inside the church. And so we mustn't get it confused because, you know, a lot of uh, those in the world um, view the church as being uh, uh, those who would condemn them of their sin. But that's not what God does. God wants to reconcile them to himself, not condemn them of their sin. Um, a passage of scripture that Paul again gives us to highlight this, this particular truth about how God uses the conscience of the unbeliever in order to change behavior. We pick it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 27 and 29. 229, should I say. Uh, 
if any of those who do not believe, so he's talking about unbelievers now, invite you to dinner, talking about a believer being invited to the home of an unbeliever for dinner, and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? So what is Paul teaching us here? He's saying when you go, uh, an unbeliever invites you to dinner in his home, um, and he says before you partake of the food, uh, this food has been offered to idols, talking about uh, a, a false god that that particular unbeliever serves. Paul says, in that instance, you're not to eat of the food. So why does Paul say that? He says, because of the conscience of the unbeliever. So Paul, how does that, how does that work out? Well, it works on this wise. To eat food that is offered to idols is obviously eating food that is offered to demons. We in the church understand that idols are, de are demons. Now, the, the person who has offered his food to his idol has been doing it all his life. Uh, that's how he's been brought up. That's the natural um, way he behaves. But Paul tells us not really because Paul says to us that his conscience, even though it is in a very weakened state, recognizes that it is sinful for anyone to offer up food that is offered up to demons. And so when the believer says, well, now I can't partake of that food because you've offered it up to this idol, the unbeliever's conscience is then strengthened to convict him of the sinful practice that he is doing by offering up his food to what the church understands are demons, which in his mind is just a, an idol that he worships. Nevertheless, the, his conscience is affected. And so Paul says, if you partake of that food, you thus weaken the conscience of the unbeliever because he looks at the Christian, he said, well, you know, if he's prepared to accept the food that I've offered to my idol and eat it, well, can't be anything wrong with it. And so his conscience is weakened. However, if the Christian says, sorry, I can't partake of that food now because it's been offered up to an idol, um, the conscience of the unbeliever is now con uh, strengthened to convict the unbeliever of that sinful practice. And so the unbeliever is now convicted to, well, there's something about this Christianity thing because this person uh, is that adamant about their belief that they will not partake of these the foods that I'm offering them. And so that's that's the concept that Paul is teaching us here. But the concept obviously gets stretched out across all aspects of our lifestyles. And so when Christians refuse to compromise their moral behavior, uh, righteous behavior, um, before unbelievers, it has the impact of strengthening the conscience of the unbeliever to convict them of their sinful practices. But when Christians, because they don't want to offend unbelievers, um, compromise on their righteous lifestyle, um, you know, because they want to walk in love, so-called, so to the unbelievers, well, that, in effect, has the effect of weakening the consciences of the unbelievers and their lifestyle don't change. They remember what happened when our Lord allowed the conscience of the those who had accused the woman of adultery. Their their lifestyle changed. Their, their conduct changed when they started listening to their conscience. And so, overall, when the church walks in righteousness, keeps sin out out of the church, and does not. Um, compromise on their righteous behavior. God is able to use that to impact the consciences of the unbelievers around them and ultimately what happens is society starts to become more moral. Now it doesn't mean that there's a, an outbreak of the gospel being preached in, in the society and that multitudes come into the kingdom of God. We're not dealing with that. We're talking about how the church impacts morality in society. When the church displays righteousness, it impacts positively 
morality in society. When the church walks in sinful practices or compromises righteousness in any way, it has a negative impact on morality in society. Society starts to become more immoral. And so that's really the points that we wanted to concentrate on in today's teaching. We wanted to just uh, highlight those points again. Um, bear with me. We wanted to highlight the, the five points, that the church demonstrates God's righteousness. We're required to do that. Uh, and that sin in the church cannot be condoned. Point number three, sin in the church negatively impacts society. Point number four, righteousness in the church positively impacts society. And point number five, the conscience is the mechanism which God uses in order to bring that about. And we're going to end the teaching.